Hey everybody, this is the third in a series of three videos that I'm making uh, about how to use a relatively inexpensive Nexstar GT or SLT mount uh, as a wide angle platform in equatorial mode to do astrophotography. In the first video, I covered off whether or not you could even use a GT mount in that case on a wedge, and that turned out very well. In my second video, I did a test to see whether or not this time an SLT mount could be used with guiding, and it could. So in this video, and this is the final one of the series, I'm going to go over the steps that you would need to follow in order to set up your SLT mount for guiding. My name is Chris, and welcome to my channel. So what do you need to get this going? First off, you're going to need a shorter focal length lens. I picked up a used Tamron for $50 Canadian. This is a lens that retailed for about $200 to $300 if I'm not mistaken. And it's not the greatest quality lens, but it should be enough for what I'm trying to do, which is to take some images that I am personally satisfied with. Now, I was looking for a lens in the 300 to 400 millimeter focal length range. My primary telescope is a 6SC, which has a focal length with a reducer of about 1,000 millimeters. So with the Tamron lens being 300 millimeters, the broken on would come in about one third of that. And at 300 millimeters, the Tamron would come in at one third uh, of the Celestron 6SE lens. So I think those would pair pretty well together to give me a lot of flexibility in my imaging. You're going to need some way to attach the lens to the mount. And for that, I picked up a dovetail and a couple of rings. Now you got to make sure that the rings that you pick up are big enough to accommodate your telescope or your lens. The dovetail bar that I picked up was a little bit too short and it wasn't adjustable, meaning it had preset screw or bolt positions uh, so that I could not move the rings. And as a result of that, uh, the rings ended up being positioned in such a way that they clamped onto uh, the focus ring or the focal length adjustment of the lens, which became a problem later on. Oh, right. So you're going to need a way to secure your guide scope to this setup. What I did is I bought another little shoe uh, that I bolted onto one of the rings. And that way I was able to take the guide camera and slide it out of the 6SE uh, shoe and put it right onto this one. That way I can go back and forth between both setups. My setup included a number of USB cables, so a USB cable to connect the guide camera, a USB cable to connect the primary imaging camera, a USB cable to connect the controller from the mount, uh, as well as a USB hub. Now, I typically connect my astrophotography camera directly to the laptop in order to minimize uh, data loss and contention. But I'm still using the USB hub for uh, the guide camera, the mount, and uh, a little USB cam with enough gain sensitivity to be able to look at the sky conditions uh, when I'm monitoring the setup remotely. So I'm using the same wedge setup that I used for my previous video, which is basically just a camera tripod with a metal bar that I fixed to it so that I could mount or position the uh, Nexstar SLT mount offset so that it uh, would balance out the center of gravity and avoid the whole thing pitching backwards. I've also had to swap the controller on the SLT mount with the Nexstar Plus controller that came with a GT mount because the Nexstar GT controller uh, is a Nexstar Plus controller which has a USB port at the bottom, whereas the SLT mount is older and has an ST4 port. 
So um, luckily the controllers are interchangeable and the Nexstar Plus controller is working just fine with the SLT mount. All right, so what we're gonna be doing is we're going to be using the hand controller to polar align and position the mount, but we're going to use a laptop to send guide signals back to the mount. This is going to work by connecting the laptop to a guide camera and a guide scope. And then on the laptop, we're gonna be running PHD2 guiding and PHD2 guiding is going to connect to the mount using the hand controller. And in order to get that to work, we're going to need a different ASCOM driver for the mount. As I discussed in the previous video, we can't use Celestron CPWI software and related ASCOM drivers because Celestron did not include wedge mode for the GT and SLT mounts. Instead, we're going to be using a Celestron telescope driver. I'm also going to be using astrophotography tool in order to control my imaging camera. Now I found that APT can't control the mount the way that PHD2 does, but I can still use it for plate solving, which would give me an idea of which direction I need to move the mount to manually using the hand controller. The ASCOM driver that I found is called the Celestron Telescope Driver, and I did find it on a thread on Cloudy Nights. I'm going to post a link to it in the description below. Now the version of this driver that I'm using is, let me just look that up here, it's the Celestron Telescope and Focuser Setup version 6.1.7350. It was simple to set up. I just had to install it with ASCOM already in place. And once installed, I was able to test it using the ASCOM device connection tester. Here we'll need to make sure that the correct COM port comes up. I have found that the COM port can change each time, so it's best to double check before connecting in PHD2. Also, make sure to set the track mode to EQ North or EQN in the Celestron setup for the driver in ASCOM. Once the driver is set up, we can open PHD2, keeping our existing guide camera and selecting the new ASCOM driver as the mount. This will be called the Celestron Telescope Driver ASCOM in brackets. Here we should be able to connect both devices and we'll be almost ready to go with guiding. The last step will be to redo the calibration since the positioning and orientation of the guide camera and the parameters of the mount have changed. Next, we'll need to connect our astro camera. I'm controlling it with astrophotography tool where I have to remember to enable cooling on the camera. With the camera connected and hopefully cooling, we can go ahead and perform a rough polar alignment using the polar scope, which I'm just going to start calling the polar pen. Now, it takes some gymnastics to get under the scope in order to see through the polar pen. And the camera tripod is not the easiest to maneuver. But with a bit of determination and brute force, I was able to visually line on Polaris, meaning I saw it in the tube. By the way, I'm doing a voiceover for this entire video because my mic had shorted out during filming, making all of the original audio unusable. Once the basic visual alignment was done, I ran through the EQ North alignment procedure on the mount using the hand controller. In order to do this, you have to select EQ North align as the method, put in the time, date, and location, making sure you have the right setting for daylight savings time if appropriate. I like to use the longitude and latitude for the location. Next, set the scope and mount such that it is parallel to the wedge. You can add an index mark with a piece of tape once you have this worked out. Once that's done, rotate the mount to point to the prime meridian, which, if you are in the northern hemisphere, will be due south. Next, you'll need to align on a few stars. It can be harder to know which stars you're looking at at shorter focal lengths, so I used plate solving to inspect where the scope was pointing compared to where it should have been. This made finding the right stars much easier. And I ended up sinking on Vega and Deneb. With the alignment done, I had to focus the lens, which was very difficult because the ring bolts were literally holding the lens by the focus ring. 
and I almost dropped the whole assembly when I loosened the bolts. And since I had to loosen the bolts, I lost my lens position, and it took me a while to get everything pointing in the right direction again. I used the Batidoff mask to do the focusing, which at least helped with that. I really wish I had gotten a better dovetail the first time around. That would have solved a lot of problems. But once I had all of those issues sorted through, I was able to use the hand controller to point the mount at NGC 7000, which is the North American Nebula, and right next to the Pelican Nebula, which was my main target for tonight. And here, once again, I used plate solving to make sure that I had the right coordinates. Now, so far, I had been using the UV IR cut filter because it made stars easier to see. But here, I was able to switch out my SV Boney dual band hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3 filter. And next, I took a few test exposures to make sure I had the nebula framed the way that I wanted it. Guiding could have been better, but I had only aligned using the polar pen. I didn't bother with uh, drift alignment this time, since I was using a short focal length. And you know what? It was good enough. I had some clouds moving through intermittently, and it was getting a little bit late, so I let the scope run as long as it could. And I ended up with an hour and a half worth of integration time. And most of the frames that ended up getting rejected were rejected due to cloud cover. In conclusion, this little setup actually works. The cost? Well, uh, it was $250 for the used mount. This is all cost in Canadian dollars. Uh, 50 bucks for the used lens, 100 bucks for the mounting, mounting rings and dovetail, uh, another 100 for the tripod, 350 for the guide scope and camera, which I already had, 100 bucks for the filter tray, 150 for the filter, another 100 bucks for the ZWO Nikon adapter, and finally, 1350 for the cooled camera. So uh, that totals up to 2550 Canadian, which uh, doesn't sound too cheap when you add it all up. However, if I would have had to have gotten a star tracker uh, or another mount to make this work, well, that would have been a lot more expensive. So... Uh, this video is not intended as advice on how to make a cheap astrophotography rig. Uh, more so, I made this as a point of interest. If you happen to have a GT or an SLT mount and you're interested what it can do, uh, well, here you go. Personally, I'm headed camping to a dark sky location this weekend, and I plan to bring this little rig as opposed to my Celestron Nexstar 6SE mostly because there's no electricity there, and I think this little rig is going to draw less power. Now, I've already bought a better dovetail, a longer one, uh, which allows me to adjust the positioning of the rings as well. And with the rings repositioned, I now have them such that they're sitting on the hard points on the lens rather than uh, impeding the focus ring. So I think I'm all good to go. So I'm looking forward to taking some wider angle images of nebulas this weekend. I hope your astronomy journey is fun and exciting, and I wish everyone clear skies. Until next time, thanks for watching.